We turn to Acts chapter 9, and we begin to read at verse 32, as we continue our journey through the book of Acts. Acts chapter 9, verse 32, let us hear the word of God. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the saints in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, a paralytic who had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and tidy up your mat. Immediately, Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. In Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, which when translated is Dorcas, who was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please come at once. Peter went with them. And when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning towards the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called the believers and the widows and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Amen and God will bless to us his word this morning. Well, it's quite a change, isn't it? The last two weeks, we've been thinking about what must be one of the major turning points in the history of the Christian church, the conversion of Saul, the Pharisee, the Christian hater who became Paul, pioneer, missionary, theologian of the church. Now it's Peter with some folk who we're not going to hear about again. We're not going to hear about Saul for another three chapters. Why does Luke do that, I wonder? Well, we aren't told. We might be keen to get on and find out more about Saul. But there must be a purpose in the Holy Spirit having Luke write these chapters. I was thinking about that this week and wondering what we might learn after the great heights of Saul's conversion. And I've gathered together a few lessons under the headings, some things we can learn about Peter, some things we can learn about the church, and some things we can learn about the Lord. So let's begin by looking at some things we can learn From Peter. We last met Peter in chapter 8, verse 25, on his return to Jerusalem after that memorable visit to Samaria. Before that, the great persecution arose at the death of Stephen, verse 1 of chapter 8, and we read all the believers were scattered, but the apostles decided to remain in Jerusalem. Philip, however, went to Samaria, of all places, and revival soon broke out, as many many believed and were baptized. And because it was Samaria, when the apostles heard about it, they sent Peter and John to investigate. Do you remember how when they arrived, they saw what had happened, the apostles prayed 
The Samaritans received the Holy Spirit. The gospel undoubtedly had spread to Samaria. Before long, Peter was back in Jerusalem. But then, the last verse last week, verse 31, we read the church began to enjoy a time of peace. The apostles were now free to travel, and Peter here is engaged in this itinerant ministry to scattered Christian groups north and west of Jerusalem. And what's he doing? Well, he's ministering, he's shepherding the flock, just as Jesus had told him to do. But I want you to notice three things about Peter and his ministry. First of all, Peter was concerned about individuals and small groups. The idea that Peter, the powerful leader of the early church, was ordering the others around is quite mistaken. He might have been the leader, but he was quite at home ministering to small groups and to individuals. Just like Jesus, isn't it? Despite the crowds that constantly thronged Jesus, he had concern, he had time for individuals. I have no doubt that as Peter visited these small groups of Christians, he would be telling them about Jesus. He would be sharing with them what he remembered of Jesus' teaching. But all that Luke records for us here are two miracles. How Aeneas was healed, how Tabitha was raised from death. He was concerned for individuals. Second thing about Peter is this. He didn't draw attention to himself. He didn't try to exercise his authority as the leading apostle. He knew he couldn't overcome disease or death by his own power? No, Peter pointed to the power of Jesus. Did you notice that? He said to the paralyzed man, Jesus Christ heals you. Before addressing the dead Tabitha, we read in verse 40, he got down on his knees and prayed, recognizing surely his need for the Lord's help. And since no one else was present, that particular detail must have come from Peter himself, mustn't it? But not only did he point to Jesus' power, he pointed to Jesus' salvation. He dared to address the diseased man and the dead woman with the same word of command. It's in verse 34 and it's in verse 40. Get up! Now, that's the verb that's used of God raising Jesus from the dead. Of course, Tabitha was resuscitated to her old life and would die again. Whereas Jesus was resurrected to a new life, never to die again. But the point's being made, surely, that recovery from paralysis... Resuscitation from death were both visible signs of the new life into which sinners are raised by the power of the resurrection. So far from drawing attention to himself, Peter was pointing to Jesus, to Jesus' power, and to Jesus' salvation. And the third thing we learn about Peter here is this. He was following Jesus' example. Now, I don't know what Peter was thinking when, during his visit to the Christians in Lydda, he found among them this man, Aeneas, who'd been bedridden for eight years. I like to think his mind went back to those early days with Jesus by the Sea of Galilee, that day when they were at Capernaum, and so many people gathered in the room in which they were meeting, so many that many had to stand outside. And as they were listening intently to Jesus, there was a great commotion. Bits of the ceiling started falling in, and then a great hall appeared. 
And to everyone's surprise, a paralyzed man was lowered down right in front of Jesus. We're told in the Gospels, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man that his sins were forgiven. Now that provoked comments from the teachers of the law. And to prove that he had authority to forgive sins, Jesus said to the man, get up, take up your mat and go home. And the man did. Well, I don't think Peter forgot that. Do you? Look at him here. Look what he says to the paralyzed, another paralyzed man. Get up, tidy up your mat. Almost the same words. And immediately the man got up. I don't know what Peter was thinking when he arrived in Joppa, having been summoned because of the death of Tabitha. And he got there, he was met by all these widows crying at the death of such a helpful Christian lady. I like to think that his mind went back to that day Again, near Lake Galilee, when the synagogue ruler Jairus came and pleaded earnestly, we're told, with Jesus to come to his house where his little daughter was dying. By the time he arrived, the girl was dead, and this crowd of people were crying and wailing loudly. Peter was one of the three disciples with Jesus. They put the people out of the room. Jesus took the girl by the hand and said to her, Talitha Koam, little girl, get up. And immediately she stood up and walked around. I don't think Peter ever forgot that either, do you? Look at him here. He sends them all out of the room. Prays. Remembering Jesus, surely remembering Jairus' daughter. And what Jesus had done, please, Lord, do it again. And then he turns to the dead woman. Not Talitha Koam, Tabitha Koam. Tabitha, get up. He takes her by the hand. And she gets up. He was remembering Jesus and following Jesus' example. What does this passage tell us about Peter? He was concerned about individuals and small groups, just like Jesus. He didn't draw attention to himself. He pointed to Jesus, Jesus' power and salvation. It tells us that he remembered Jesus and followed Jesus' example. Lessons for us, aren't there? Oh, you say, but it's easy for Peter... He'd been with Jesus for three years. He'd seen these things with his own eyes. Think again. We have the Gospels, four of them. We can read them. We can reread them. We can get to know Jesus and what he said and what he did. We can read what Jesus done in the lives of Christians for the last 2,000 years. We have our own experiences of what Jesus has done in our lives. And we have the Holy Spirit within us, pointing us, reminding us of Jesus. Let's learn from Peter to be living Christ-centered lives, behaving like Jesus in our concern for individuals, Pointing to Jesus' power and salvation rather than to ourselves. Following Jesus' example. Oh, I don't mean going around performing miracles. These were were for that time. These were signs of an apostle. These were proving that Peter was an authentic apostle of Jesus. We shall be so steeped in our Bibles that we're thinking, what would Jesus have said? 
What would Jesus have done? You sometimes see people wearing these bracelet things with the words, with the letters WWJD on them. I nearly said young people, but I saw quite an old guy wearing one the other day. WWJD. What would Jesus do? That's what it means, apparently. That's fine to wear a bracelet, but if we were just all the time thinking to ourselves, what would Jesus do in this situation? When we're faced with this decision, what a difference it would make. Let's learn from Peter to be living Christ-centeredly. Secondly, this passage tells us some things about the church in these places where Peter was visiting. Look, first of all, at how the church members, we would say today, how the Christians, but of course they weren't called Christians till later, but how the church members are referred to in this short passage. Look in verse 32, they're called the saints. In verse 35, they're referred to as those who turned to the Lord. In verse 38, they're called the disciples. In verse 41, they're called the believers. And in verse 42, they're referred to as those who believed in the Lord. That suggests quite a lot about the church members, doesn't it? First of all, they believed into the Lord. Last week, we had printed on our order of service sheet the vows of church membership. And the first and the most important one is, do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? You see, believing in the Lord is more than just believing certain things about the Lord. I guess many people can accept that Jesus is the Son of God or that Jesus rose from the dead. That doesn't mean they're Christians. The belief we're talking about is belief into, trust in, reliance upon, commitment to. It's more than accepting facts about Jesus. It means accepting Jesus, committing ourselves to him. We believe in one God and confess Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord because that's what he's become for us. That's what it means here by saying these people believed in the Lord. They'd accepted him. They'd yielded their lives to him. They believed in the Lord. Secondly, these church members were actively following Jesus. We read there that they turned to the Lord. The word means that they they turned around. See, they'd more than changed their minds they changed the whole direction of their lives. And they were now actively following Jesus and his teaching. That's what the word disciple means. Disciples are follower, a learner. And then thirdly, these church members were not only trusting Jesus and following Jesus, they were becoming like Jesus. We don't tend to use that word saints for Christians today, do we? We reserve it for special Christians of long ago, for people in stained glass windows. That's wrong. Wrong to do that. The early Christians were regularly called saints. The basic idea of the Greek word is holiness. It reminds us that all Christians are set apart to God and are being made increasingly holy by the Holy Spirit. In other words, they're becoming like Jesus. 
So these church members were people who believed into Jesus, who were following Jesus, who were becoming like Jesus. But these verses also tell us not only about the church members, but about church growth. In verse 35, we read that all who lived in Lydda and Sharon, that's the neighboring village, saw Aeneas and what had happened to him and turned to the Lord. I don't think the all there means every single person in these villages. It means the majority, most of them. In verse 42, we read that what happened to Tabitha became known all over Joppa and many people believed in the Lord. So in both places, in both places, a goodly number of people became Christians. When did it happen? When they saw what the Lord had done in the lives of two people they knew well. That really backs up what I said a few minutes ago about these miracles being signs of a true apostle. Their purpose, the purpose of these signs, was to authenticate and illustrate the salvation message. So people heard the word, they saw the sign, and they believed. Often today, Christians are looking for miracle healings just for themselves. What's the difference? The church grew when people saw the power of the gospel transforming the lives of people they knew. Well, let's just think about applying that to today. Church members. How are church members referred to today? As do-gooders? As church attenders? As respectable people? As religious folk? Folk who don't do this or that? Folk who are different because they're queer? Or... Or are we known as those who believe in Jesus? Those who are following Jesus? Those who are becoming like Jesus? Those who are different because they're holy? And how does the church grow today? By adopting some new program? By modernizing the singing? No. By the preaching of God's word and the praising of his name, as our city motto has it. And also, we see here, when people see the transformation in the lives of people they know well. Is your life, is my life, backing up what we say about Jesus? Thirdly, this passage tells us some things about the Lord. It tells us that the Lord was at work healing this man, raising up Tabitha. Because it wasn't Peter, was it? It wasn't Peter who performed these miracles. It was the Lord demonstrating that Peter was his apostle, showing that he had the power to transform lives, showing that he was worthy of trusting and following. He's at work. Tells us that he was building his church. It wasn't Peter who turned them to the Lord. It wasn't Peter who made them believe in the Lord. It wasn't the people themselves who worked themselves up to this. No. It was the Lord himself convicting them giving them the gift of saving faith. But there's something else. There's something else that the Lord was doing that, that really lies beneath the surface here. And this is what I want us to just look at briefly. It becomes apparent later in the book of Acts. It's this. The Lord was continuing to prepare the way for the next great advance of the gospel. 
Up to now, the gospel has spread throughout Jerusalem, through Judea, on into Samaria. And we know from chapter 1, verse 8, that it's going to spread to the ends of the earth. It's going to spread to the non-Gentile, to the non-Jewish, the Gentile world. Ananias was told that Saul was to be the Lord's chosen instrument to carry his name before the Gentiles. And we're going to be see, seeing how Saul did that. The Lord was already at work preparing Saul, but there's more to be done. There's more preparation needed before this event that would revolutionize the church and change the world happened. Peter, Peter needed to be ready too. And here, the Lord was getting Peter ready in three ways. One, by taking Peter to Lydda and then to Joppa because Tabitha died the Lord was getting Peter within reach of the man we'll meet next week, Cornelius. Here, here was a man whom the Lord had chosen to be the catalyst for this great change concerning the church's ministry to Gentiles. Now, Peter had no idea. Peter had no idea that a Roman centurion was going to call him. There he was, quietly ministering away to these small groups of believers. But the Lord had got him to Joppa. The Lord had got him to the right place at the right time. Because he had a much bigger job for Peter to do. Secondly, whilst in that area, Peter was discovering that the gospel had power to transform lives of people who weren't pure Jews. I think it's significant that these two characters in the miracles had the names that they had. Aeneas is a Greek name. Tabitha is of Syrian origin. Now that doesn't prove that they were Gentiles. It does indicate some non-Jewish connections. And it points to the fact that the gospel was beginning already to touch the Gentile world. Peter, of course, had seen what had happened in Samaria. But now, Peter himself is being used effectively amongst people who weren't pure Jews. Must have set him thinking, at least. And then thirdly, the Lord was preparing Peter by showing him that he wasn't bound, Peter wasn't bound by Jewish ceremonial law anymore. The last verse just slipped in there. Our chapter tells us that Peter was staying in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Now, Since tanners worked with dead animals in order to convert their skins into leather, they were regarded by Orthodox Jews as ceremonially unclean. In fact, they were required to live a certain distance away from Jewish villages. Pious Jews would have nothing to do with tanners. And here's Peter staying with Simon a tanner. And the Lord is still using him. That's the point. Do you see how, in these different ways, the Lord was preparing Peter for the spread of the gospel to the Gentiles? Peter, of course, knew nothing of that at the time. It was as he looked back, he would see what the Lord had been doing. And that tells me that the Lord who had promised to build his church was determined to build his church. And he went to great lengths to get his man ready for what he was going to do. 
But you see, the Lord hasn't stopped building his church, has he? There are still many, many people around the world, and there are still increasingly a number of people in in Glasgow, in Scotland, who haven't heard about Jesus. And the Lord is still at work preparing messengers, men and women, for his work. And like Peter and Joppa, they aren't aware of it at the time. It's only looking back that we see, sometimes, not always, see what he's been doing. Maybe that explains that upset or that delay or that wrong turning in your life. Could it be that the Lord is preparing you for his work? Getting you into the right place at the right time. With the right thoughts. Because he's something significant for you to do for him in the years to come. So don't go complaining. Don't go complaining about where he's placed you today. You don't know what he had in store for you tomorrow. Peter was following the example of Jesus. The church was showing the transforming power of Jesus. The Lord was preparing for the spread of the message of Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, may our lives, may our lives individually, may our life as a church be more and more Christ-centered and Christ-honoring. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.